This video will cover the second part of Learning Objective 13.1, where we're talking about the components of prejudice for our social psychology PSY 235. We've already talked about the cognitive component. Now we need to talk about the affective component, which refers to the way in which our attitudes make us feel. <clears throat> and in some ways, it's how the attitudes are formed. So when we think about the affective component, uh, we're talking about the, the way in which um, att attitudes can be driven by um, feelings such as anger, hatred, guilt, sadness, whatever emotion that, that you want to, to attach to it. The attitudes can have that emotional valence to them. And this is one of the reasons that prejudice, when it does have this strong affective element to it, <clears throat> where let's say you have a prejudice attitude towards a particular group of people, and it takes the form of hatred for that group, distrust of that group, fear of that group, those emotions are both justified by the stereotypes, by this, the cognitive uh, aspects of the attitude. Um, they're, they're justified by those attitudes, but they also cause us to develop more of those stereotyped attitudes to justify the feelings. <clears throat> so the, the affective piece makes it really hard to argue with someone. Once people are very emotionally invested in an attitude, arguing with them tends to reinforce their affective uh, state and make them, like if their attitude is based in anger, it makes them more angry to challenge them. If it's based in fear, it makes them more fearful to challenge their attitude. Emotional reasoning is one label that's sometimes used to describe this affective component um, of prejudice attitudes. <clears throat> and many researchers describe emotional reasoning as something you just can't argue with using data using logic, you've probably had experiences like that, like, you know, with a family member or a friend who has very different opinions than you about a particular social group or a social issue, and they have an emotional aspect to their feelings about that issue. When you talk to them, if you're, you feel differently, trying to give them facts and information means that you're trying to change an affectively based attitude using a cognitive argument, and it tends not to work. So if you go back to <clears throat> the attitudes and attitude change chapter, I talked about the fact that, you know, marketing, you need to know whether an attitude is primarily affective or whether it's primarily cognitive. If it's an affectively based attitude, if you want to market to that person, you need an affectively based message. If an attitude is more cognitively based, you can use information. So um, if, if a person's prejudice attitudes have this strong emotional component, it makes them even more resistant to change, especially when our attempts at change involve making cognitively based arguments. <clears throat> The emotional components of prejudice do tend to run quite deep, and they are often found by researchers to be tied to deeper structure kind of value statements in people's, um, uh, the way they construct their view of the world. So, for example, <clears throat> many people who say they have a prejudice uh, that's affectively based against a specific racial group um, or, or a, a, another group categorization, like say illegal immigrants as a category name. Let's say that a, a person has a very angry, hostile, um, attitude toward that group called illegal immigrants. Sometimes what those emotions are tied to, uh, very strongly is a deep seated sense of, um, some researchers call it, um, you know, values-based entitlement that is tied to one's um, group identity. So just to follow the example, 
if you have an attitude holder who is a white person who is um, working class, um, politically Republican, for example, they they may have a very affectively based reaction to say the words <clears throat> illegal immigrant, and it ties back to some deep deep structure values and beliefs that are associated with um, what living um, a, a well-lived life should look like. It means hard work. It means investment in your community. It means all of these things. And the attitude itself has become attached to that. Um, and you can come up with other, other kinds of examples uh, as well. So um, regardless of the type of prejudice, if the if it is heavily affective, that can create some challenges um, over and above the difficulty of challenging the stereotypes themselves. When they are layered with emotion, um, it makes them even more impervious to change. <clears throat> in research described in your text uh, by Fisk, Cuddy, and Glick, you can kind of see some of these, these interactions. Stereotypes so the cognitive component and the affective component are inextricably tied. So stereotypes can shape our emotional reactions. Our emotional reactions can also shape our stereotypes and reinforce them. So when we're, we're thinking about groups, entire groups of people, um, Fisk, Cuddy, and Glick argue that you can use a couple of different dimensions that and then you can put people in different spots in terms of your your uh, group stereotypes. So one dimension is for, is a competency direct dimension. <clears throat> and this dimension runs from seeing people as incompetent all the way to seeing them as competent. The other dimension is the affective component. So on the horizontal, you've got a cognitive element, beliefs about competency, on the vertical, you've got an emotional response, either cold or warm. And then you have labels for the emotions that can come with those. So if you have warm reactions and you perceive a group to be competent, it tends to lead to admiration. If you see people as competent, but you don't like them and you feel cold toward them, that can prompt envy. <clears throat> if those emotions are cold and you see people as incompetent that leads to emotions of contempt um, and it can even go in the complex direction of disgust if you have warm feelings toward a group but you think they're incompetent that can lead to pity so for example um, if you look at attitude surveys about people with disabilities for example and this is another example of positive stereotyping you may see a person with a disability um, and, and feel warm, so you may have positive emotional reactions toward them, but at the same time you see them as incompetent. What that tends to lead to is the emotion of pity. Pity is not a positive emotion. <laughs> it, it's emotion that says, aw, I feel bad for you. I feel bad because you're so incompetent and so disabled, right? It's kind of a backhanded slap. Um, on the envy side, think about um, a social group that has more things than you do, uh, but you don't like them. So if you, you look at politics right now, for many people on the left, they look at um, many people on the right as being um, excessively wealthy, selfish, unpleasant people. Um, but uh, many of those individuals wouldn't mind having their money. So it, it create, creates envy. Um, on the contempt side, if we see a whole group of people as incompetent, um, and maybe we could add some components there of being not just incompetent, but also being morally um uh, bankrupt and we don't like them the, that's the cold component that leads to hatred so for some racial and ethnic groups for for example or some religious groups um, there's an actual contemptuousness 
in the attitudes towards those groups, and it comes from this dimension of incompetency and coldness. Now, our in-groups, the groups we belong to ourselves, we tend to see our own group with warmth as well as competency, and to explain away examples of our, of our own group doing very bad things, for example. Now we need to switch gears and add the behavioral component. And remember that these three components of prejudice do not function independently um, all the time. They often are combined in a, a system of prejudice and discrimination. So the behavioral component is actual discriminatory behavior. So doing things that harm other people. So when we think about the definition of discrimination, the, the textbook definition is unjustified negative harmful actions toward members of a group simply because they belong in that group or you put them in that group. Um, discrimination can take many different forms. Sometimes it's direct and personal. Sometimes it's institutional. So let's start with institutional forms of discrimination. Um, typically when what we talk about with with respect to institutionalized discrimination is denials of opportunities, denials of rights um, that should be embedded into daily life. So for example, denial of equal access to housing, denial of equal access to jobs, equal access to high quality education, um, and so on, or even access to being able to vote. All of those things can be institutionalized forms of discrimination. In a workplace, another way to think about this is that it would be um, discriminatory uh, impacts in terms of the ability to get advancement in your workplace, uh, to get equal pay in your workplace, uh, to um, not be harassed in your workplace, for example. Institutional discrimination can impact um, some uh, target groups more than other target groups. You know, just to give you an example that's been in the news in uh, recent months in Northeast Ohio is the issue, the continuing impact of redlining strategies in impacting um, black and brown people in terms of their ability to get mortgages and to buy homes in certain locations. So what you have is sort of a historical, um, institutionally based um, strategy, which has basically locked uh, black people and brown people out of the market uh, for for affordable housing in in various regions, um, you know, within their home base. Um, sometimes this was, was very obvious. Like one of my colleagues here many years ago, he bought a house in Alliance, and he looked at the deed, and the deed had language on it, um, which indicated that the neighborhood in which his house stood could not be sold to uh, black people. Um, so in some cases, it's concrete. You can see it in the paperwork. Now, this was a historical document. It wasn't still enforced. It, it was like the original documentation on the, the home. Certainly those rules weren't in place, but if you look at a map of where people still live in Alliance, it is very racially segregated. In, in this town. So um, same goes for Canton or Akron or Cleveland. You still have a fair degree of racial segregation in terms of housing um, within those cities. So that's an example of an institutional, um, actually it's several institutions that are involved, but they have discriminatory, discriminatory impacts on, on certain groups. Uh, that are very negative, very problematic. So the typical areas in which institutionalized discrimination shows up um, are education, housing, employment. Uh, we see it uh, tremendously in healthcare outcomes. Um, being able to get loans, even to get bank accounts and credit cards in terms of the way credit scores are calculated in the criminal justice system, etc. So you can find discrimination um, in all of those spheres. What's difficult oftentimes is being able to identify the origins of these discriminatory patterns and to document 
cause and effect, <clears throat> you know, identify the specific cause because it's often so infused into the history of the the institution that it's hard to tease apart the the process by which these discriminatory practices got into place. Now, in addition to um, institutionalized discrimination, there's there's regular everyday discrimination that people who are in groups that face discrimination and prejudice um, deal with every single day. Um, so we need to think about uh, more than just those big picture things like housing and employment and education and so on, but also looking at what sometimes are called microaggressions, but also um, not just tiny, but bigger forms of discrimination that hit individuals on a very, very regular basis. And you may have heard the term microaggressions. Um, so social psychologists define this concept it, in terms of just everyday slights, put downs, indignities, things that people experience on a regular basis. So, for example, um, uh, one of my former students, this is uh, several years ago when malls were still popular, she told a story in class, in my social psychology class, about how she and her friends, she's um, African American, would uh, go shopping and they would routinely be followed by security guards um, in in the mall. Um, whereas, you know, if, if she was with her other black friends, um, they were followed. If she happened to be in the only black person in a group of white kids when they would go shopping, the security guards would still target her and follow her, but not her white friends. So that's an example very clearly of a, a an everyday form of indignity that people of color routinely face when they're out in public. Um, various other things, you know, just straightforward expectations and assumptions like in this this picture that I found um, this assumption that black people don't swim <laughs> uh, which is a, uh, a stereotype that's unwarranted an assumption that black people will be athletes and so on um, you know pick whatever kind of social grouping you want to explore prejudice and discrimination in and there will be these patterns of persistent microaggressions. And also, you know, not just micro, but bigger um, hits that, that are, are damaging and harmful. In some research, it's been found that the more of this sort of everyday discrimination that people face, um, the greater their levels of stress, the greater their levels of anxiety, the greater their levels of um, depression, the greater the risk of developing health complications and health problems that are associated with those that constant exposure to everyday discrimination. So the impacts, even though we call them microaggressions, the impacts of long-term exposure are very, very large. Um, so you need to think about them less in terms of the, the, the micro part of the word and more in terms of what the research actually shows us in terms of um, outcomes. <clears throat> um, in a study by uh, Corral and colleagues the, that is described in your, your text, um, your, your authors use this as an example of the way in which prejudice can lead to discrimination how, in ways in which they can be linked. Um, what they did was they had uh, research participants, these were college students who were white, watching videos of young men in a variety of different situations that were pretty mundane, pretty typical situations. Half of the people that were in these videos were black um, and half were white. Um, and the situations varied. Um, half of the men in each group in the videos were shown holding a gun um, half were shown holding non-threatening objects. The participants were seated at a, a computer, so like a lot of social psychology research, we have to gamify 
the methodology a little bit. And, and basically the participants had to uh, do what's called a shoot, don't shoot task. Um, and, and basically what the participant is asked to do is to push the shoot button if they perceive a threat due to a gun being present. They press the don't shoot button if they perceive no threat in the situation that they were watching. So um, the white participants were more likely to over-assume the threat of a gun when the people in the videos were black. Um, and it, it really didn't me matter what they were actually holding. So basically what these researchers were wanting to show was something called a shooter bias. Um, and, you know, this is an example of, of researchers who are trying to create in the laboratory um, a model for exploring um, why the di there's a disproportionate number of people of color who are shot and, and either wounded or killed in police interactions. So they want to, to figure out, you know, what are some of the variables that are involved there. And what they found was that even when uh, participants, white participants, didn't measure high on paper and pencil tests of uh, their prejudiced attitudes. What was actually kind of going on was this implicit bias that tended to encourage them to over perceive um, threat in the form of black men. And, and it's regardless of whether they have a gun in their hand or not in the video. Um, so it, they can have an innocuous object like a shell phone in their hand, and that activates that well-worn prejudice path that may include a common stereotypical belief that black men are dangerous um, and likely to be a threat. Um, once that stereotype is activated, it changes the way we perceive situations. So um, the most errors in the study were found when what was being, you know, the video involved a, a black individual who wasn't holding a threatening object. They were holding an innocuous object. There were relatively few er errors made when the black person was holding a gun in the video. So basically, people appear to be primed to see things that are consistent with their stereotype. Um, when they were seeing something not consistent, they were primed to misperceive it um, as something else. So just to, to, to review, you know, I include this graphic from your text so that you remember to look at it carefully when you're reading. Um, when you had the video involve a white person, um, you had an equal number of errors in both conditions where the person was depicted as being armed versus unarmed. When the person in the video was a black man, um, the errors go up when they're unarmed. So they were inaccurately identifying a threat, um, which displays the stereotype that black men are dangerous people and are their innocuous behaviors are more likely to be misinterpreted because of that underlying prejudice. That concludes my coverage of Learning Objective 13.1.